Hello friends, Megan Farner asked me to record a little keynote address for uh, her Latter-day Disciples podcast se uh, seminar conference, <clears throat> and I asked her, well, what would you like me to talk on? <clears throat> and she said, you know, I'd really like you to talk on <clears throat> you just the need for people to open their own minds and strive to draw near to the Lord and not rely on other people to, you know, teach them everything that they need to know about the events of the last days. <clears throat> and that is, you know, something that's near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'm happy to, uh, to talk about that today. Now, it's a beautiful spring day. Uh, here in the south, so you're gonna hear birds and lawnmowers and You know, I've got a flag over here. It's gonna be flapping around. Hopefully that doesn't bother you um, I just want to you know, go through a couple of scriptures uh, with you today and Just talk about You know what they mean you know in the book of Isaiah the Lord tells Isaiah, come, let, let us reason together. And I think that, you know, that's something that, you know, we can stand uh, to do a little bit more of. For some reason, we have this, you know, aversion to talking about theoretical gospel topics, even though in the uh Doctrine and Covenants, it says that we should meet together and discuss uh, theory and doctrine and laws and principles. It says that in numerous verses. Now, why is it important to talk about, you know, gospel theory? Well, the theory of how, you, what the gospel means to you, that's how you live the gospel. And the fact of the matter is, is all of us are operating under different gospel theories. Even though we hear the same um, conference talks, we read the same scriptures, uh, we receive uh, the same lessons on Sunday, and we you know, study from the same manuals. When we look at things, we perceive them based off of our own life experiences. And I never ceased to be amazed as I go through the New Testament at how surprised the 12 apostles were when Christ said, hey, we're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to lay down my life and I'll rise again in three days. Yeah, they couldn't conceptualize that. They figured that he had to be speaking symbolically somehow. And then he was crucified and they were shocked. <clears throat> then of course, when he was resurrected, they were shocked. They did not believe that it could have happened. They didn't believe Mary when she came back and said, he's risen. So are we any different? What are we missing the boat on that we think we understand that we probably, you know, don't? Well, let's talk about, I'm going to, first thing I want to you know, talk about is a, a passage in Alma chapter 12. <clears throat> now, in this passage, Amulek and Alma, you know, they've been talking to some apostates, trying to get them to come around. And, you know, they're just doubting everything that these guys are saying, Alma and Amulek. You know, and they're saying, how could you even know these things? And Alma, you know, gives them a very interesting response. Listen to this. <clears throat> this is in Alma chapter 12, Verses 9 and 10. 
And now Alma began to expound these things unto him, saying, It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they should not impart only according to the portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same is... the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he knoweth them in full. What are the mysteries of God that Alma is talking about? You know, are we talking about some obscure, heavy doctrines here? Or are we talking about things that are fundamental to our salvation? Well, I think that it's the latter. Case in point, Jesus Christ, bar none, is the greatest mystery of the Old Testament. Because the Jews did not understand those prophecies, even though they thought that they did. They rejected Christ when he came. That is very, very interesting. And, you know, so many times I hear people say, if I need to know something, then the prophet is going to tell me. Well, is that true? Is it the prophet's responsibility to drag our carcasses into the celestial kingdom? Or do we need to do that ourselves? This this sounds simple on the surface, the answer to that. I mean, when uh, Elder Bednar says, listen, it is not up to us to teach you everything that you must know. You must learn what you must learn, and you must do what you must do. That means we have a serious responsibility to understand the doctrines of the gospel. So what then are the responsibilities of our leaders? Well, they're the administrators, the key holders over the ordinances of the gospel. They protect the church from you know, false doctrines and things like that, but you know, they're not going to expound the mysteries from general conference in a setting where, frankly, many are, are struggling just with things that are, you know, as basic um, as, you know, the, the definition of what a family is. You know, so that is why we need to take responsibility for these things. Now, I'm going to uh, read another passage to you. This passage comes from the Joseph Smith translation of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 42. And this is really interesting because he, he really has some changes to these verses. And it really modifies what these passages mean. And I want to read these to you and you know, then just you know, share my thoughts about what this means. And I want you to think about what you think this means. So Joseph Smith translation of Isaiah 42, 19 through 23. For I will send my servant unto you who are blind, yea, a messenger to open the eyes of the blind and to unstop the ears of the deaf. And they shall be made perfect, notwithstanding their blindness, if they will hearken unto the messenger, the Lord's servant. Thou art a people seeing many things, but thou observeth not. Opening Opening the ears to hear, but thou hearest not. The Lord is not well pleased with such a people. 
But for his righteousness' sake, he will magnify the law and make it honorable. Thou art a people robbed and spoiled. Thine enemies, all of them, have snared thee in holes, and they have hid thee in prison houses, and they have taken thee for a prey, and none delivereth for a spoil, and none saith restore. This is this is really interesting. I mean, clearly the uh, Lord's servant here is Jesus Christ. Who did Jesus Christ go to? He was sent to minister to the house of Israel. He did not go to the Gentiles. So when the scriptures are saying that these people are blind, it's us. We are the ones that are blind. Now, it's easy for us to look at the Jews and say, yeah, those doofuses, they just didn't get it. But we need to look in the mirror and realize we're the doofuses too. Because Christ came to give us a message, to open our eyes to things, to see things in a new way. And thank goodness for most of us that our forefathers had the spiritual strength and courage to accept the gospel. Because if it were left to most of us to do this, and kudos, hats off to those of you, know, you that are listening that had the fortitude and the courage to join the church um, you know, in your lifetime. Because it is not easy. It goes against the grain. Uh, there's a lot of opposition. And you really need to be able to listen to the Holy Ghost for yourself. But for those of us who have inherited our faith from our forefathers, we're just like the Jews. Now, you might say, how, how, can, you, how can you say that when, you know, we go to conference and we listen to the uh, prophets and we do what we we do what they say. Do we <clears throat> do we do what they say? The church would be dramatically different if we did everything that President Nelson said. Have you ever asked yourself? I mean, President Nelson is famous for dropping these bombshell one-liners. <clears throat> But have you ever noticed that he hardly ever explains what it is, you know, that will cause those things? You know, for example, you know, recently he said that we were going to see the greatest miracles the world has ever seen in our day. And then he moves on. <clears throat> what? What What are the greatest miracles that the uh, world has ever seen and why are we going to see them in our day what does that mean for the hours uh, in which we are living in what about his probably his most famous of all time you will not survive the coming day unless you have the constant guiding influence of the holy ghost and then he moved on why will you not survive the coming day what is it about the coming day One of my you know, favorite things that uh, he did was uh, um, he invited us all to stu study the covenants and promises that the Lord had made with the house of Israel. And he said that if we will do it, we will be amazed and that we should look for these covenants to be fulfilled in our lifetimes. Now, friends, the reason why I say that we are that we are the Jews uh, today is because all of us, you know, assume answers to all of those statements that President Nelson says, and we do it in a, in an instant, and then we move on, and that's exactly what you know the or original apostles did. And 
because they just presumed answers. You know, case in point, when Christ said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. He said, my apostles assumed that I was talking about the Gentiles. But they were wrong. They were dead wrong. And because of their utter lack of curiosity, and because they did not seek, because they did not knock, the Father did not open this to them. Think about who we're talking about. The original Quorum of the Twelve did not receive because they did not knock. We, all of us, we receive, as Alma taught, the apostate Nephites. We receive according to the heed and diligence which we give unto the words of God. So look at Joseph Smith. How many of the incredible, fantastic doctrines of the Restoration were only received because he thought to ask. What's the last question that you have asked the Lord? If you're not asking the Lord questions, you're not getting answers. You're getting push notifications when you need them. But there's a lot more to it than this. Much more to it. If we are just putting our spiritual education in the, <clears throat> in the hands of our leaders, which are very capable hands, <clears throat> and that's, that's where it ends, what about everything that the Lord would teach you if you asked him? See, this is where the theory of the gospel comes into play. Because I have absolutely learned that an incredible number within the church today believe like Laman and Lemuel believed, which was, the Lord will talk to Lehi, but he will not talk to me. So if I want to learn about something, I'll just either go and ask my dad or I'll just assume he's going to tell me everything I need to know. How different was Nephi's approach? And Nephi is a teenager, guys. And he is going and talking and pleading with the Lord. Just think about the first verse. <clears throat> I'm gonna, let's, let's read the first verse. Very first verse <clears throat> in the Book of Mormon. I, Nephi having been born of goodly parents. Therefore, I was taught somewhat in all the learning of my father. What does it mean that he was taught somewhat in all the learning of his father? Well, it means that his, his father taught him a lot of what he knew. But remember what uh, Alma said, hey, the Lord puts people, particularly prophets, under strict command. They're not supposed to share, you know, certain things. Well, you may, you know, ask yourself, well, aren't you talking about these things? Yeah, but look who I am. I'm another bozo on the bus. Whatever I say, it's meaningless. I mean, I'm just like you. I have no, you know, credibility. Um, for anyone to listen to anything that I have to say. The only reason that you know anybody should listen to a word that I say is if the Holy Ghost testifies of something that I'm talking about. And then you better listen up. So this is what um, Nephi is talking about. His father taught him some things, okay? And having seen many afflictions in the course of my day, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, 
having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record of my proceedings. Guys, do you get what Nephi is saying here? Yeah, I was taught by my father somewhat. But mostly, guys, I was taught by the Lord. And he revealed great mysteries unto me. And so, you know what? I'm, this is why I'm writing this record. It's basically to testify to you that you can have the same experiences that I've had. In fact, it, you know, I encourage you to go and look at 1 Nephi chapter 10. Okay, This is in 1 Nephi chapter 9. Nephi finishes his little abridgment of Lehi's writings. And then, you know, he just talks about the different plates that he's using in that abridgment in chapter um, 9. And then chapter 10, he's really getting ready to tell us his own experience that he has had in receiving the same revelations that his father has received. And he goes in to say, listen, the Lord is an unchangeable being. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he taught me these things, he will teach you these things. But yet, honestly, you need to ask yourself, what do you believe about this? Because many people do not, absolutely do not believe this. They believe that the Lord will reveal all things to someone else who then will tell them everything that they need to know. So can you see how our theories of the gospel impact the way that we live our lives and our approach to the Lord? I, I hope that you can see that. Now, I, I want to share some more um, passages from Nephi because he's just a marvelous example of this. Um, <clears throat> basically, everything that he is writing, it's all a testimony of this fact, of that first verse in the Book of Mormon, that, listen, I've been highly favored of the Lord. And what does that even mean? It means that the Lord... He has a relationship with the Lord. The Lord has been answering him, talking to him, but not out of the blue. Nephi was going to the Lord, and that's how this happened. <clears throat> so, beginning in verse 11 of, or, or chapter 11 of 1 Nephi, Nephi you know, starts with his dream the vision that his father saw. And that vision is pretty incredible. I mean, it, it talks about amazing things, all of which you're very familiar with, so I'm not going to go into them. But then we get to 1 Nephi chapter 14, verse 17. And listen to what he says. And when the day cometh, that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil. Then at that day, the work of the father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people who are of the house of Israel. Friends, this is not what you think it is. Okay, he's saying that the destruction of the whore of Babylon is the sign that the father is going to fulfill the covenants that he made with the house of Israel. Hopefully, you're going, whoa, 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 whoa. The covenants are that Israel, scattered Israel is going to be gathered isn't that going on? And hasn't that been going on since 1830? That is precisely the question that you should be asking. Because guess what? The whore of Babylon has not been destroyed. And we have been working on gathering Israel for a long time now. 
And, you know, we're doing a pretty good job. We've got 17 million people. Mm, yeah, 25% of them, we don't know where they live. And, you know, of the balance, probably 25% come to church. But, yeah, we're gathering Israel. But this isn't what Nephi's talking about. Nephi's talking about the 10th article of faith. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. The restoration of the lost 10 tribes, that happens after the whore of Babylon is destroyed. Think about that. When is the whore of Babylon destroyed? Well, talks about that in the book of Revelation. And it says that it's the false prophet who shall hate the whore and him and his 10 horns that follow him, his 10, you know, kings that, you know, are without a kingdom but rule with him for one hour. <clears throat> they will hate the whore and they will destroy her and uh, burn her with fire and they will do it in one hour. That is the sign that the lost 10 tribes are about to be restored. Have you ever noticed that? Now, that's the last portion of the vision that Nephi is permitted to talk about. The very next verse, verse 18, and it came to pass that the angel said unto me, hey, look, see that guy? He's going to write about these things. You're not Nephi. And others who have lived, they have written these things. But you're not going to do it, Nephi. Why? Why wasn't Nephi allowed to write these things? Let's look at verse 28. <clears throat> and behold, I, Nephi, am forbidden that I should write the remainder of the things which I saw and heard. Wherefore, the things which I have written sufficeth me. Well, guess what? They didn't really suffice him because then he went on and transcribed 19 Isaiah chapters, all of which talk about what he saw in his vision. Guys, the important component here is the restoration of the house of Israel, what that looks like. There is something that is so impressive, so monumental about it that Nephi wasn't even able to talk about it. So who did talk about it? John, Isaiah, Ezekiel, other people that wrote in, frankly, Daniel. Uh, isn't it interesting how many of these people that wrote about these things lived concurrently with Nephi? Daniel lived concurrently with Nephi. They were probably right around the same age. You know, they, they were in the, the same deacon's court. Then you have Jeremiah. He wrote about these things. Really cool prophecies from Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 16, he says, listen, the days are coming when no one is going to talk about when the Lord divided the Red Sea. Instead, you want to know what everyone's going to talk about? When he restored those from the North countries. And yet, you know, shame on us because we don't understand these things. And we've had these scriptures for 200 years. But we don't understand the blessing of what it is that we have. Um, and why? Personally, I think because we're waiting for someone else to teach us instead of grabbing the bull by the horns and, you know, like Nephi did and learning about these things for ourselves. Now, I mentioned that Nephi transcribed 19 Isaiah chapters into his book. He talks about what those chapters mean um, after every section that he transcribes. 
Case in point, let's look at uh, chapter 21 of First Nephi. So this is a transcription of Isaiah 49. Listen to the chapter heading. The Messiah will be a light to the Gentiles and will free the prisoners. Israel will be gathered with power in the last days. This is where he's left off. He didn't talk anything more about this after that. After that. He said, I couldn't. But now he's putting it in here. Okay. Then he starts giving a commentary on what that all means in chapter 22. Listen to the chapter heading. This is Nephi, not Isaiah anymore. Israel will be scattered upon all the face of the earth. The Gentiles will nourish Israel with the gospel in the last days. Israel will be gathered and saved, and the wicked will be burned as stubble. Nephi is associating the burning of the wicked with the gathering of Israel in power. Now listen. Listen to... Nephi's explaining this. He's getting pretty excited about what he's writing. Then in verse uh, 29 of 1 Nephi 22. And now I, Nephi, make an end. For I durst not yet speak further concerning these things. What is it about the restoration of the house of Israel that is so incredible that Nephi is worried that, oh, I'm going to, the Lord told me not to talk about this, and I'm kind of talking about a little too much I'm worried about. You really think that this is about missionary work? Because <laughs> um, I don't. There, this is what President Nelson was talking about. Study the covenants the Lord has made with the house of Israel. And if you do, you will be amazed and look for those covenants to be fulfilled in your life. Guys, we are missing the boat. And just ask yourself, if the Lord didn't let Nephi talk about this, why would he let President Nelson? Hmm. Let's go to the last um, couple of chapters of um, Second Nephi. This is, Nephi has now transcribed everything he's going to transcribe. He's given us all of the explanations that he has been permitted to give us. And he is filling it. I mean, he, he is upset. You know why he's upset? Because he saw us. He saw our day. He saw what was happening, to, going to happen to his, you know, seed. And he saw that we'd have his record, and he saw what we would do with it. And listen to how he closes his account. I'm going to read from 32, verses 7, starting in 7, and then I'm going to read verse 4. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn. Because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff neckedness of men. For they will not search knowledge when it is given to them in plainness, even as plain as the word can be. And then he goes on in verse 4. Wherefore, now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. Is it President Nelson's fault if you perish in the dark because you didn't do these things? No, no way. It's yours. You have resources at your disposal to be able to understand these things. The Lord is the greatest resource of all. 
Okay, now I'm outside on the front porch and the sun is going to set in 20 minutes. So I better better start, you know, moving. I, I, there's a couple other passages passages that I want to I want to read. <clears throat> so in the Joseph Smith translation of Isaiah 42 that I that's the passage that I opened up with. Said that the Lord would come and he would you know hopefully open the eyes of the blind. And we're not talking about people that are physically blind. We're talking about people that are spiritually blind. And it's the house of Israel. It's us. So he comes and he gives us a message. And I've talked about this message so many times, I'm not really going to talk about it here other than say it's a special message from the Father and you better study it um, because Christ commanded us to study it multiple times. Um, in the first couple of verses of 3 Nephi chapter 17, uh, he said, listen, go home and pray about these things because I started teaching these and I can see that you're not getting it. Go home and I'm going to come back tomorrow and I'm going to finish this. Um, if you look at that message, it's very impressive. Uh, and Mormon was going to record the whole thing. But the Lord stopped him, just like he stopped Nephi. Now listen, this is in Third Nephi chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. This is the Lord talking to to Mormon. And when they shall have received this, meaning this account in 3rd Nephi, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, if it so, shall so if it shall so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest to them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them to their condemnation. Behold, I was about to write them all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. So the Lord gave us this message to see if we would listen to what his son said. And his son commanded us to study it. And we don't. We haven't. We have not done a good job. And when I say we have not done a good job, I'm talking about the church. Because by and large, we are completely ignorant of these things. If you know about these things, well, I'm not talking about you. But there are far too many people that don't understand that these things are even there. They can't believe that they would be there. They believe that if they were there, if there were things of this magnitude, someone would put it into their little bird beak. A mama bird would chew up the worms for them and stuff it down their little gullet, and they'd know everything that they needed to know. It's just not how it works. That, did it work that way for the Jews? Is that, uh, you know, when God announced his son through John the Baptist, the wild man in the wilderness who ate, you know, bugs, uh, was the Lord or was God the Father uber interested or highly concerned with the fact, hey, people may not listen to this guy? No. Why? For the exact reason. I will try the faith of my people. Can you hear him? The Jews thought they could hear him. Now, let's move on to um, Ether chapter 13. So, 
in this chapter, it's an incredible chapter. I mean, the, the book of Ether is amazing. It's an incredible book. He's seen all of these amazing things. He's read all of these amazing things. He's, he had the sealed portion of you know, the writings of Jared. And friends, I guarantee you that the reason that those are sealed, they talk about exactly the same kinds of things that we should be studying and learning by the Spirit. And if you are being taught by the Spirit about these things, I guarantee you, you already know what's in those sealed plates. I'm not saying that somebody down in Brazil has, you know, the actual sealed plates. I'm not saying that at all. I don't believe that the uh, sealed plates have been revealed yet. And it's because we have taken lightly that which we already have. So the Lord isn't going to be bestowing much greater gifts on us because he's so impressed with what we've done with the things that we have. No, that's not the case. But if you will go to the Lord, he will you know, open the windows of heaven. He will teach you personally through the administration of the Holy Ghost. And I think that it's, it's important for people to understand what the Holy Ghost is. I mean, this is a fundamental tenet of, our gospel, of the gospel. Um, and we really don't understand it very well. And that is, what is the Holy Ghost? Well, the Holy Ghost, he is a man. And he just hasn't received his body yet. But he's witnessing everything. He witnessed everything that Christ did. And he testifies of the truthfulness of those things. He testifies the truthfulness of all things. And he does it through the medium of the light of Christ. Now, what is the light of Christ? The light of Christ is not a person. It is a thing. It, the uh, scriptures tell us that it fills the immensity of space, that it goes forth from the throne of God, and that it is the power whereby all things are governed. It is by this medium that we are taught. Think about the, the incredible numbers of human of the human family across the cosmos. You know, the Holy Ghost is the teacher, the testifier. He, he's not everywhere all at once. He still has a spiritual body. I have this body. I can't be over there also. You know, so how it works is, I like to think of it as the Holy Ghost... He's the network administrator. And the light of Christ, well, that's the Wi-Fi that permeates the vastness of the cosmos. Everybody can be connected to it simultaneously. And the Holy Ghost is kind of the, the, the admin. And as you begin seeking the Lord and connecting more and more with the light of Christ that is within you and you develop that muscle more because the truth be told the gift of the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ are in fact the same thing the gift of the Holy Ghost is just the light of Christ in greater abundance if you have paid the price to accumulate it in greater abundance if you don't it's a gift that you have not received. So think of it this way. You know, we're all smartphones. We're blank. We come out of the, the box, and we've got incredible potential. But right out of the box, the only thing that we can do is connect to the Wi-Fi. And then it's kind of up to us what we're going to do. There are incredible applications that through the Wi-Fi, we can connect and download. And guess what? 
they can radically change us. So now we're not only a, a cell phone, now we're a calculator. And now we're a, an entertainment system, we're a radio, we're a, you know, <clears throat> a camera. I mean, we can be anything, you know, with these, a GPS uh, mapping system, um, a, a barcode scanner. I mean, through, you know, the our Wi-Fi signals, we can download and completely upgrade ourselves. Or we can stay like we were out of the box. Whose responsibility is it to put apps on our phone? President Nelson's? Because that's what most people think. And it's wrong. You are. If you don't download those apps, you don't have them. And you don't have anyone else to blame. You don't have the, uh, I'm not very good with technology excuse. The Lord will enable all of us to learn. That's why he gives us all spiritual gifts. We don't all have the same spiritual gift. And we don't all have to. But you know what we do have to do? We have to seek. We have to knock. We have to look. And then the Lord can find us. But he will not lead us somewhere we're not asking to go. Our free agency means too much to him. So I'm going to close on this last passage. Third, our, uh, Ether chapter 13. This is you know the close of the book. And Moroni is just kind of summarizing some of the incredible things in this chapter that, he, you know, he has learned. And, I mean, one of the things, like, you, know, you just look at, uh, you know, the third verse of this. It says, he's talking about, Ether was talking about all these awesome things that are going to take place in America. And that it was, it was the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven. That is incredible. You know what you should be thinking about? If you're familiar with Christ's message to the Nephites, you know who he said would be in charge of that new Jerusalem? A remnant of Jacob. And then whoever would come could help them with it. And that is coming down out of the heavens. So now um, let's look at verse 12 of this. He's talked about a lot of things. I'm going to let you go and look at those. And when these things come, it bringeth to pass the scriptures which saith, there are they who were first who shall be last. You know who he's talking about? Who was the first that was scattered. It's the lost tribes of Israel. He's saying they will be the last to be restored. Okay, so they who were first shall be last, and there are they who were last who shall be first. I and I was about to write more, but I am forbidden. Guys, I hope that you understand that there is something in here that you're not going to find in the manuals. You're not going to find in most likely, you're not going to find it in your Sunday school classes. You're not going to find it in the Enzyme or read about it in general conference. You know how you are going to find about it? Because, and the reason why I say that, have you heard about it before? No. Um, have you heard, 
hey, study third Nephi. Hey, study the covenants the Lord's made with the house of Israel. You've had these prompts that should be hurting you to where you should be going. Go, go look over here. But guess what? You got to look. I can't tell this to you. That's the message of Nephi. It was the message of Mormon. And it's the message of Moroni. And it's my message to you. If you want to learn these things, you need to learn them yourself. Listening to me talk about them is not enough. Listening to other YouTube videos, it's not enough. You know, what is enough? The Holy Ghost. Tapping into the Holy Ghost. You know, expanding those spiritual muscles. Receiving the gift that you've already been promised in greater abundance. And if you do that, you will learn things that are much greater than I could ever teach you or ever should. And that's how it's meant to be. It's not meant, you know, you're not supposed to, the Lord's plan isn't for you to go and drink the water from the cow pasture. He wants you to go and drink it from the waterfall. He's the living water. Go and get it there. Feel free to use other people as resources. There's lots of tools. Again, people have different spiritual gifts. Take advantage of those. The Lord put people in your life for a reason. Use those tools. But realize that good, better, best, the Holy Ghost is the best. Everything else is underneath that. Being taught by the Lord personally is the best. And there's a, a passage in the Old Testament when this is shortly after the house of Israel crosses through the Red Sea and, you know, they're in the Judean wilderness, uh, the, well, the wilderness, you know, the wilderness of Sinai, and it's desolate. And the Lord says, you know what, Moses? Gather them up. Rally the troops. I'm going to talk to them. And they're going to know that I am their God and that they are my people. Gather them to the base of Mount Horeb. We're going to do this. And so Moses tells the people, hey, Go sanctify yourselves because the Lord's coming. And so the people go and they wash themselves and they come to the base of Mount Horeb. And then a dark cloud descends on the top of the mountain and the ground begins to shake and they see smoke and steam starting to come from all the rocks in the seams and they see flashes of lightning and they hear the sounds of trumpets blowing from the clouds. And they go nuts to this. And they run to the opposite side of the valley. And Moses goes, guys, what are you doing? This is the Lord. He wants to teach you. It is your right as his people to hear this from him. And you know what they say? No way, Moses. That's your job. You go talk to him. Then you come and tell us what he says. We're going to be over here. That wasn't what the Lord intended, but it's what happened. And guess what? The Lord doesn't intend for you to only hear his voice twice a year in general conference. That is not the intention. He wants to teach you. You are his beloved son or daughter. And if we will act like it and seek counsel from him, ask him what we should be studying and listen to those promptings and act on them, he will begin to open our eyes. I promise you that. Friends, I hope that this has been helpful to you, that has given you something to think about 
and that you will act on whatever promptings that you've had as we've talked today. Because there is no harm in discussing the, how the gospel applies to us, how we perceive the gospel to be. In fact, I think if we did more of that, we'd be further along. Well, until next time, friends, I hope that you, you will draw near unto the Lord so that he can draw near unto you. God bless.